A very good evening. The Right Honorable Tun Arifin bin Zakaria, Chief Justice of Malaysia. Yang Bage Tun Dato Sri Zaki Tun Azmi, former Chief Justice of Malaysia and Judge of the DIFC Courts. Yang Bage Tun Zaidin Haji Abdullah, former Chief Justice of Malaysia. Yang Ahmad Arif Tan Sri Zulkifli Ahmad Makinuddin, Chief Judge of Malaya. Yang Ahmad Arif Dato Dr Haji Muhammad Naim bin Mosha, Ketua Hakim Sharia. Yang bagi Dato Professor Sundar Raju, Director of KLRCA, Honorable Judges, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome to the special edition of Evening Talk this evening at the Bangunan Sulaiman. The title for this topic, this talk, is Multiplication of Arbitral Institutions in Asia and the Middle East, Promoting Synergies and Collaboration. Today's talk is jointly brought to you by the KLRCA, the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn Alumni Association, Malaysia, the Malaysia Inner Temple Alumni Association, the Malaysia Middle Temple Alumni Association, and the Malaysia Chapter of the Honorable Society of Grace Inn. We have four exceptional personalities with us this evening. The talk will be delivered by Mark Beer, and will be moderated by Dr. Ma Wing Kwai. Joining the both of them on the panel later on are Yang Bage Tun Zaki Tun Azmi and Dr. Professor Sundar Raju. A few words about this evening's moderator. Dr. Ma Wing Kwai is a retired Court of Appeal judge. He's currently a consultant at Ma Wing Kwai and Associates and he's on KRC's panel of arbitrators and is a certified mediator by the Malaysian Mediation Center. Without further ado, can we please put our hands together for the Dr. Mao Inquire. Uh, thank you very much for, that, uh, for those words of introduction. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yang Ahmad Arif, the Honorable Chief Justice, Dun Arifin bin, uh, and um, Dun Zaki, Bin Tun Azmi, former Chief Justice, um, Tun Zaidin, former CJ, Tan Sri Zukifli, CJM, Honorable Judges, Tan Sri Tan Sri Dato Dato, Dato Sundra, ladies and gentlemen. This evening's talk is of particular interest to all of us who are uh, into arbitration, and we have the distinguished guests. Mr. Mark Beer, to talk to us on the topic of multiplication of arbitral institutions in Asia and the Middle East, promoting synergies and collaboration. A quick check on the various uh, national arbitral centers and regional centers uh, shows that Japan started off way a long time ago in 1950 for the Asia region, and for the Middle East, it was um, Saudi Arabia way back in 1983. So let's listen to Mr. Mark Beer who will talk to us on this topic. Mr. Beer is the Chief Executive and Registrar of the DIFC Courts, a judge of the Courts Small Claims Tribunal, Chairman of the Courts Users Committee, a member of the Rules Subcommittee, Registrar of the Special Tribunal related to Dubai World and Chief Executive Officer of the Dispute Resolution Authority, is Vice President of the Middle East for the International Association for Court Administration. Under his management, the courts have secured a reputation as one of the most efficient commercial courts in the world. He has played a key role in the development of the courts, many formalized relationships with partner judicial systems in the region. He previously worked for MasterCard Worldwide, where he was Regional Legal Counsel for South Asia, Middle East and Africa, and later Vice President, heading regional government relations and corporate services. Mr. Marbia will speak to us for about 45 minutes, and after that we'll have a panel discussion where we'll have uh, Tun Zaki and Dr. Professor Dr. Dato Sundra on the uh, panel. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Beer.
Anyway, thank you for the introduction. It's very kind of you. Um, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice, I, I can't go much beyond that because the nomenclature, the titles that you have here, I'm still getting used to. But Tanshri, Tanshri, Datto, Excellences and Superstars, thank you so much for allowing me uh, to speak. And guess where we got the idea to be the most efficient commercial court in the world from? the person who drove efficiency in your judiciary really from the get-go. <laughs> Let me give you a bit of background about myself. I started life, well, I won't go that far back, but I started my legal career in a law firm. And then, because I can add up, which is quite unique for lawyers, uh, they asked me if I'd like to go and build hedge funds in Switzerland, which I did when that was a good thing to do. MasterCard then called up and said, look, we'd like someone to look after the legal stuff for 92 of probably the least exciting, well, least honeymoon destination countries in the world, spanning South Asia, Middle East and Africa. And I said, I'd be delighted. They then asked me, oh, they found out I'm here. <laughs> You'll protect me, won't you? And then in 2008, I was asked to join the DIFC courts, and we did, when I joined, what's called a perception audit. That is, we went out to the media and to businesses and to lawyers, and we said, tell us what you know about the DIFC courts, the Dubai International Financial Center courts. And the best we could get was, are you near the fitness first gym? Now that's good because it meant that there were no perceptions that we had to change at the outset. But from 2008, in seven years, we have gone from zero to being described as the world's most advanced commercial court, which is a precursor nowadays to being described as one of the top three commercial courts in the world. We also set up the Dubai World Tribunal, which has restructured over $100 billion of Dubai world debt. And I've been delighted last year to be asked to run the Dispute Resolution Authority, which looks after the courts, an arbitration center, a wills and probate registry, and an educational establishment called the Academy of Law. So it's busy. It is worth saying that these views tonight are my own. You don't have to agree with them. In a sense, you might get the view that they're slightly inflammatory for a reason. But the call to action is real. And when I started thinking about this talk, it, I started to think about the proliferation of dispute resolution centers in Asia and the Middle East. There's a lot of them now. And it took me back to the crisis, the economic crisis. And I want you to focus on those two images. Who will be next? Remember the uncertainty of 2009? September the 15th, 2008, Lehman's filed for bankruptcy. Look what happened. So quick, that change. And the reason I wanted to talk about this crisis is take yourself back to that time. Everybody was a stock trader. If you got your shoes shined, you were told the latest stock tips. When I used to drop the kids at school, the housewives would be telling me how much they'd invested in the stock market. Everyone was involved. Everyone was an expert. Everybody knew the next trend. The boom would never end. It was an economic miracle like none before. Perception overtook reality. And then in this hiatus, this excitement, it all crashed suddenly. And who were the losers? Us, humans, families, children, workers, they all lost. Small banks, they all lost. Who won? 
the big banks. They got the bailout. They won because there was a flight to trust. A flight to trust. What on earth has that got to do with dispute resolution in Dubai and Kuala Lumpur? Well, bear in mind the speed of change and beware of the behemoth. Keep those at the back of your mind. Let's have a look at the arbitration market worldwide. On the supply side today, everyone is an expert in arbitration. Talk to a lawyer in a law firm, and what do they want to be when they retire? I want to be an international arbitrator. What do you know of it? Oh, I know lots. I've been involved. I've spoken to my friends, like the traders during the last crisis. Everyone's an expert in arbitration. Everybody wants to be in arbitration. Every day of the year, there is an arbitration conference somewhere in the world. Every week of the year, we seem to have a new arbitration center open. And every month of the year, there seems to be a new set of rules that have been issued by an arbitration center somewhere. Sell, sell, sell. Arbitration is good. Arbitration is good. It will be forever successful. It will never slow down. That's the message we're hearing, right? So does anyone disagree there is plenty of supply? Great. Let's look at demand. Globalization over the last 25 years has transformed the world. Trade flows globally have gone through the roof and domestic courts have been a bit slow to respond. So this has been the golden years for arbitration, filling the gap that the domestic court can't do. The crisis helped enormously, that crisis that we referred to. Uh, Global Arbitration Review said that between 2010 and 2012, 50% increase in the number of claims filed in international arbitration worldwide. 50%. And claim values went from $643 billion to $1.6 trillion during that time. And during that time, we've seen the emergence of fabulous arbitration centers who have really dominated now and taken an important position on the world stage, like SEAG. So all's good. Not really. Look at the real figures. Look at the centers in emerging markets. Most of them now have a caseload lower than 2008. Some of them have a caseload lower than 2002. Number of cases dropping. Time for cases to be resolved on the rise. Investment treaty arbitration on the decline. Financial services connected arbitration on the decline. But we're buoyed because we've got commodity arbitration and energy arbitration. Whoa, yeah, oil price. For how long? How long will it shore up the numbers? And will it compete with these pressures? We have a general counsel forum in our courts. In fact, I think we were the first court in the world to acknowledge that lawyers in-house have different views to lawyers in private practice. I know that because I've done both. Lawyers in private practice have pressures, billings, the need to win. Lawyers in private practice want the money. Sorry, lawyers in-house want the money. In fact, if you talk to general counsel about disputes, they say all the one to three things. I want the right answer quickly and cheaply. Okay? That's what drives them. You don't get that from lawyers in private practice. Of our 14 general counsel of major global financial and other institutions around the world, of the 14, 12 will no longer choose arbitration to resolve their contractual disputes. 12 out of 14 have fallen out of love 
with arbitration. Why? Because the promise was it would be fast and cheap. But it isn't. It's slow and expensive. And as we get more and more talent, sorry, as we get more and more centers opening around the world, one a week, someone's got to run them, someone good. So there's a scarcity of talent. And people at the top of arbitration centers are moving around the world. They're hopping from Ixid to Dubai to Bahrain to wherever. So the cost of staff is getting higher. The rise of international courts. Now, the London court, as you know, has been international for years. 60% of its business has nothing to do with the UK. SICC, DIFC, AIFC, state-owned international courts are on the rise. Enforcement, that's what arbitration is good for. Not anymore. East of Dubai, there are very few countries that are reliable enforcers of arbitral awards. Malaysia's one, Singapore's one, Hong Kong, Hong Kong's one, Australia's one. Get to China, get to India, Indonesia. And look at the talent that is being spent on destroying arbitral awards, the talent that lawyers are applying to scupper the enforcement of arbitration awards nowadays. And the privacy, which was so sought after, is now known as opacity. It's dark, it's hidden, there's no sunlight. So the pressures on international arbitration are there. They're the CDO pricing messages that we all could have seen in 2007 but chose to ignore. They're there. You think you've got it bad? We have more arbitration centers in Middle East, North Africa than we have central banks. We've got, we've managed to amass so far 49. We've got eight in the United Arab Emirates, five in Egypt, three in Lebanon, and Bahrain, which is about as big as this room. They've got three as well. 49. Who's paying for them? Because they put you, they don't make money. Government pays. And these are governments dependent on oil revenues, uh oh, and trade flows, double uh oh. So if you're a government funding eight arbitration institutes and you are under fiscal pressure, what are you going to do? You're going to close one. Oh no! The ZF 83-LC ICC Center in Mozambique is closed. Oh well, never mind. But it isn't the ZF 83-LC ICC that's closed. Please, would someone name me, and there's a prize in it. Here we are, a beautiful Burj Khalifa. Could you name me the two global markets which were described as the most exciting in terms of the growth of global arbitration just a few years ago? Which two markets were described as the most exciting in terms of growth? China, yep. Mm. India. Who got China and India? This is yours, sir. Come and collect it. <laughs> Fantastic. China and India. They're so exciting. There's billions and billions of people there. Six days ago, LCIA closed its arbitration center in India. It started. It started. 
more to come. Now, if you're advising clients and you happen to have in your contract LCIA India, what have you got to do now? To change the contract. And if LCI India can fail, what are you going to do with the contracts that have got DIFC in? KLRCA, HKIAC, CTAC. Are you going to wait? Or are you going to say to your clients, look, I think we should look on a flight of trust? ICC, Geneva, LCIA. They are safe seats, deep pockets, global marketing, high salaries, huge reserves, safe seats. Do you remember uh, an explorer called Charles Darwin? Have you all heard of Charles Darwin? He went to the Galapagos and all that stuff. And he came up with a line, survival of the fittest. Does anyone know Garfield? Right? He changed it to survival of the fattest. Okay? When it comes to global arbitration, it will be survival of the fattest, not the fittest. Never fear, though, because global international arbitration institutes like DIFC, LCIA, and KLRCA, they're really taking action by watching. We're watching the rise of the international courts. Many arbitrators are turning their noses up at the new techniques of converting court orders to arbitral awards. Who's heard of that? We're not even watching, guys. You can convert a court order to an arbitral award. We're not watching. We're turning a blind eye to the new Hague Convention, which is being signed up by nations around the world to allow court orders to carry like arbitral awards are meant to. And worst of all, we are letting lawyers play games with our reputation. We are letting lawyers get away with murder, with implementing unnecessary delays, with putting huge pressure on the arbitral panel, including file crimi filing criminal proceedings against arbitrators, which is now the new technique. Why is it a great technique? Well, the arbitrator is immediately biased. So if you win or you lose, one side can complain. And enforcement. We are allowing our profession to mess up the very heart of arbitration by allowing conferences where lawyers come together to exchange notes on how to destroy the enforcement of arbitral awards around the world. We're watching. Our Lehman's is coming. And when it comes, that's what will happen. And you know, it gets worse. Harmonization of rules is about the silliest thing I have come across since Cherry Coke. By harmonizing rules, we take away differentiation. If we want to make it easy for people to move, harmonize the rules. Stand for nothing. Be a sheep. But harmonization of rules will make us all, I'm afraid, pay dearly when this happens. OK, crisis, disaster. Don't worry. <laughs> there is a solution. Um, but we've got to take action, and we've got to take action now. We need to start to unify the emerging centers, Kuala Lumpur, DIFC and the others around the world, the ones that, that are not yet on that global safe seat radar, we need to come together as soon as possible. We need to engage 
And we mustn't just engage with ourselves, we must engage with the courts. Because together, courts and arbitration centers are three times stronger than their individual sums. We must engage with the courts. The courts and arbitration center must give the same message. Come to Kuala Lumpur, you will have an efficient, well-run arbitration process, and the courts will protect you and enforce it. Judges need to be trained. You know, we talk about training judges. It's someone else's problem, right? Well, the lawyers should do it. Well, the judges should do it. Well, ICC should do it. Well, KLRCA should do it. Someone should do it. It doesn't matter who. But if you want the judges to be the best at the game in understanding international arbitration, someone needs to teach them. Legislation needs to be the best it can be. And we've got to stop lawyers who gain the system. We've got to stop lawyers who discredit the very foundations of our arbitral and judicial regime. Because the trust we build today, we need to store away. Because we'll need it. The trust we build today, we need to store away. So in my view, to embrace the future is to embrace collaboration. There's three things I think that ought to be done. Number one is we need to focus. We need to focus on what we need to do. We need to focus on getting the law right, focus on training the judges, focus on uniting, sending a united message out between courts and arbitration centers in emerging markets. We need to focus on what we do well. Number one, focus. Number two, strengthen. What we're doing really well, let's do it better. Let's be the best at what we offer. And thirdly, we must differentiate. We've got to do something different. It's a Let's not play the same game. I, I arb rules. Brilliant. Let's do something different. Focus, strengthen, differentiate. Because if we fail to do so, we will, you, me, and all the other emerging arbitration centers, we will surrender international dispute resolution in our arbitration centers and our courts to the safe seats. But if we get this right, if we focus, strengthen, and differentiate what we do, if we unite and we collaborate, over time, with that bank of trust, we can become the world's leading dispute resolution centers. We can do it through unity. We can do it through collaboration and we can do it through trust. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that excellent presentation. If I could kindly have uh, Dato Ma to join Mark on the panel, as well as Tunzaki and Dato Professor Sundar Raju. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Beer, for that wonderful uh, talk. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a panel of uh, three very, very uh, eminent speakers. Uh, a very quick introduction. Uh, Dato uh, <laughs> Sundra, of course, is the chief of uh, KRCA, and uh, he'll be telling us uh, what the challenges are, really. And um, Tunzaki, of course, is the president of uh, Lincoln's Inn uh, alumni. And this is, in fact, a collaboration between not just KRCA, but you'll see all the four ins. Um, can can we start with? Um, do we just start first? Yes. So 
Assalamualaikum and good evening to everybody. I want to dispute what Mark has just said. He has both painted a very gloomy picture in respect of uh, the smaller uh, seats. I want to dispute him because KLRCA has been in existence for the last how many years? 30 years? 30 years, 5 years. We were not, we were surviving until of course Dr. Sundra took over, then we are flying upwards. And I hope you continue that, Dr. <laughs> for myself, speaking for myself, I really would like you to continue being in this, uh, where you are now. So if we have survived for the last 30 years, why shouldn't we survive for another 30 years? Of course, I don't disagree with Mark that we have to improve ourselves. We have to improve ourselves. We have to bring good arbitrators, recognize, and then promote ourselves. Nato, you created the Islamic, uh, Islamic, uh, I, I, what you call, I, I arbitration. I, whatever it is for the Islamic. Uh, and uh, we have to create, as Mark has said, we have to keep on creating. Of course, if we are together, of course we'll be stronger rather than being uh, uh, separate and apart. So uh, that is my immediate uh, comment on the, what Mark has said. And uh, let me see what else have I said. Oh yes, uh, I totally agree with Mark that the courts must work with arbitrators. arbitrators. <coughs> when I became the president of the Court of Appeal, I, had, I was invited to dinner with the Chartered Arbit uh, uh, Institute of Arbitrators. And I was seated next to, what's her name? Lady, that lady. Huh? Teresa. And she was complaining and said, look, your judges are not making decisions the way we should be making. You're not supporting arbitration. I said, you have to teach them. Can we hold a, a weekend seminar? And they did. After I became a judge, CJ, they did in February. And I'm told immediately after that, the trend of decisions of the courts as far as arbitration is concerned changed to be arbitration friendly. We must not allow lawyers to abuse, to abuse the law, to abuse the whatever it is, to make arbitration, to, 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 to make arbitration failures. And I totally agree with Mark that the courts, the courts must A, not interfere too much with the decisions of arbitrators, B, if lawyers try to charge arbitrators for criminal offenses, as has happened before, the courts must try to protect the arbitrators. That's my comment, Datuma. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Datuma. Um, Actually, I, I agree with Mark on a number of things, but some points I don't agree. But I, let me start with the points that I agree upon. I, I, I think um, the first point, I think, is that um, the safe state, the, the safe states, uh, safe seat concept is being sold very hard. It's a very hard sell in the system. In fact, uh, when I travel to market KLRCA, I have to deal with that because uh, Malaysia is seen as a semi-safe seat. It's not seen as a safe seat like Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, but you know, it is due to legacy issues. But when I look around me, there is only certain states that will be safe seats. China is not a safe seat. Uh, India will never be a safe seat. All these powerful emerging countries will never be safe seats. It is the city states with total control, or perhaps uh, the developed democracies who are also in total control. So uh, I, I think you know. So I think we have to. Uh, we we are between a hard rock and the deep blue sea. 
on the stage. So I think we have to find our direction. I think that I agree with you. And the only way we're going to find our direction is through cooperation. We have to collaborate. And more importantly, we have to work together. You know, I think, the, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that we have been seeing is that all the opportunities that are now coming out through the system, I mean, take something as, as one belt, one road. China has come out with this one belt, one road. What did they say about this one belt, one road? A lot of uh, people will say, oh, it is China's way of asserting itself. But in that, there is an opportunity, especially for the emergencies, because they are in emergency. So in fact, I spend a lot of time now thinking, how can I actually get into that action? Now, the other thing is that there are a number of places where there are no representation where arbitration is concerned, or even uh, court processes are concerned. The Middle East, I think, is an example. Uh, Mark, you know, it's very interesting. You say you have 49 institutions, but the credible institutions are few. <laughs> I think that you pointed out quite clearly. And I think, uh, again, that calls for some kind of uh, analysis on uh, when you have, like I always say, uh, jurisdictions must have airlines. And you have one national airline and perhaps a number of budget airlines. But all airlines serve people. And those that don't serve people will fail. So I think it is, uh, it is almost coming to that nowadays. Uh. The, the other thing is that, is arbitration going to go away? I don't think so. It's because of the New York Convention. The very success of the New York Convention uh, is being now emulated through the Hague Convention. And the Hague Convention, I think, uh, uh, I think we, had, uh, we don't have what, uh, ten, 10 states have signed up so far. There are 20. Right. Uh, I, but, but it's moving fast. There's a lot of discussions. In fact, uh, I, I'm really not sure whether the Hague Convention is going to work because it's going to serve the countries that are really in and well developed. So, uh, you know, most probably the, 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 the states that will rectify that convention will be the developed countries and the city states. And that's where you're not going to get enforcement because most probably India will not. So you may not get them into the Hague Convention. So you're, 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 if you're going to enforce in India, it's not going to happen. Or in China, it's not going to happen. So I think, uh, again, that, that, that part, I, 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 I don't agree that it is going to replace. But what it really brings to mind is the point, the other point that Mark has made, that there are going to be alternative structures coming through the system. And these alternative structures are going to be viable. And they are going to be, some of them are going to be real alternatives, particularly in certain jurisdictions. So uh, I, I want to actually talk about also the other thing. The harmonization that is going on through the model law, through the arbitration rules, the ancestral arbitration rules, and also the New York Convention cannot be reversed. As long as international and global trade continue to grow, it can never be reversed. So what is going to happen, there's going to be more and more institutions being setting up, and this is healthy. But in Malaysia, I think uh, we can only support one institution, and we, and we have to be efficient. The moment we are not efficient, because you know why? We are actually competing, not in Malaysia, actually with our neighbors. Our real competition, in fact, I never look into Malaysia. I say to whoever wants to set it up can set it up. But the real competition is Singapore, Hong Kong, and then I have to look at China, and I have to look at the other parts of the region. So the, the, the game is a bit different. So, uh, I, but I agree also with Tun. The courts, in fact, I, one of the things when Tun became CJ, I still remember went to see him. I said, Tun, please help. <laughs> I said, you know, please have a look at arbitration. Uh, uh, and uh, please try not to set aside an award for the next three years. <laughs> I mean, I was so stuck. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, you look at the merits. But the fact that uh, Singapore and other safe seats actually started with this concept of earlier interfering a lot in the process, then subsequently being hands off, and then being totally supportive in the sense with reasons, very clear reasons. And now it's very interesting with the LIPO case talking about passive remedy, 
interfering again to a certain extent. So again, it, 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 is, it is seen now as where you actually come to age and you have the confidence, then perhaps you can explain to the world at large that when you actually set aside an award, you are doing it for good reason and with good judicial reasoning. And so now it's becoming part of the jurisprudence. So I think that is very, very important. And talking about training, you know, one of the things that KLRC is really participating is that we are committed in capacity building. And you all would know the courses we are doing, the international diploma in arbitration, we are doing it here. And we make sure the judiciary is always offered scholarships. If I can offer more, I will offer more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beer, would you like to respond to those comments? I, I would. And as I mentioned at the beginning, two, two uh, things. One is those views are entirely my own. Um, and uh, secondly, they were designed, in a sense, to uh, trigger a discussion. But I, I will just respond in, a, in the same vein. Um, one of the lawyers on our general counsel forum uh, is a general counsel of a major bank in the United Kingdom. And that bank lent 75 million pounds, so over 100 million US dollars, to a company in Kuwait. The London-based law firm, who drafted the facility document, or at least signed it off and gave an opinion, inserted LCIA arbitration to resolve disputes. Lo and behold, the Q80 company didn't pay. The bank then got advice that LCIA arbitral awards are not enforceable in Kuwait. But that they had no choice but to go through arbitration because no court would take a contract which had an arbitral clause in it. Two million pounds they spent on the arbitration in London to get an entirely unenforceable award. The general counsel then reviewed the entire file and found a letter from a partner of the law firm recommending LCIA arbitration. A letter before action was sent to the law firm saying that they must compensate the bank for their losses. The law firm's insurer paid in full. Thinking about enforcement is very important when drafting contracts. Arbitral awards and frankly foreign court orders are not enforceable in many countries that have signed the New York Convention. We've got some if you look at that map I showed you. Some countries will issue a court order which says that you can enforce it but the enforcement process itself can take up to 10 years. So I, I think the idea that enforcement becomes a differentiator is, is difficult in many of the emerging markets of the world. But enforcement is going to be absolutely key. And that's where the courts come in. You see, if you know that you can get an arbitral award from KLRCA, that as a matter in essence of rubber stamping, it will turn into an award out of the Malaysian court, a highly respected judiciary around the world. That piece of paper truly carries. Because if you want to get into China, forget the New York Convention or any convention, you need a treaty. UAE's got one. I don't know if Malaysia's got one, but certain markets do. So what you need out of that is the arbitral award needs to convert to a court order from a market where there's a treaty into China, then you get enforcement. Same with Russia. So the route to the money is convoluted, but the more the courts can come together to facilitate that routing, that as if you're an American, or routing of an arbitral award to the right court in order to get the right order to get enforcement in the target jurisdiction, Whilst at the same time allowing access to New York Convention, you're starting to double up your chance of recovery quickly. So at the heart of success of arbitration centers going forward are the courts that support them. And at the heart of the success of the courts that support them is the connectivity between the courts. The knowledge that a judgment in Malaysia 
can be brought to the DIFC courts and converted to a DIFC court order, which gets you access to the whole Middle East by treaty, China by treaty, France by treaty, Kazakhstan by treaty. There are three countries, we've worked really hard on this, so I'm a bit passionate. There are three countries left in the world where we feel uncomfortable about our judgments being enforced. North Korea, it's not a big trading partner for the Middle East. Turkmenistan, Western Sahara, three. So if we can find a way of getting an arbitral award from you to the Chief Justice, to us, you open up a whole world of possibilities that didn't exist. We, we should. I, I, I think this is a very fascinating uh, concept of, uh, of uh, actually converting into a judgment and then using reciprocal arrangements to actually enforce it, which is a new way of, uh, of doing things. I think enforceability has always been the issue. Uh, but the, the other point I wanted to talk about, if you don't mind, is uh, LCIA. LCIA India. In fact, I think it, one message that came across of the shutting down of LCIA India LCI India has been there for seven years. Huh? Uh, I know AJ Thomas works very, very hard. Uh, they got about maybe about, uh, I think about uh, 20 cases, 20 cases in seven years. But you see, one thing is that so I suddenly realized that LCIA was not in for the long haul. You have to, when you start an arbitration center or any kind of concept, you have to be in the long, for the long haul. And uh, I, they, 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 in fact, LCI, I was quite surprised in the first place why they started India, because it was an underserved market. The LCI branding is so good. Uh, they thought that if we seat the arbitration in India, then it will work very well. I think that was a mistake. In fact, I think we were all trying to seat the arbitrations outside of India. <laughs> that was the selling point. We, when I go to India, I tell them, look, you, know, you must actually use KLRCA because you are seated in Malaysia. It's a safe seat. Where India is concerned, because we have, uh, we are, we are actually on the Gazette. I mean, you know, the, the strange thing about India is that uh, you, you are. It's a New York Convention country, but you must be notified by Gazette. And Malaysia is one of the countries notified by Gazette. Not all countries are notified by Gazette. So I think you know, when they went in, they were quite brave. I, I suppose they did their calculations, but I thought that they, if they stayed on, let's say, especially with now the rule, new ordinance change. They, they would have a better chance now. In fact, the timing of the shutdown was also surprising for me in the sense that, I, I mean, we can discuss this, but I, I'm, I'm trying to recruit the chap who was running L LCIA <laughs> India. <laughs> Seriously, you know. Because, the, talent, uh, the talent, the talent, that guy is quite good. Thank you, uh, Nelsondra. Uh, we now come to the most important part of the evening, that's Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, if any questions, please address it to the panelists. A question about enforcement of these arbitra arbitral tribunals. You were saying that the court have to play a role as far as Malaysia is concerned. I think Tunzaki had just mentioned that we, we are pro arbitration and provided the facts are correct for us and you know, in, in coming to a decision. But the question was also mentioned just now by both uh, Dr. Sundra and Mr. Mark that you may have to face a problem notwithstanding that uh, judgment has been entered by the arbitration center, and then the question of uh, uh, being signatory to the Hague Convention or, or the New York Convention. But there's also a hurdle mentioned just now that there must be a treaty you know, to ensure that the, the, the country concerned will enforce that, that, that so-called judgment uh, uh, handed down by the arbitra arbitration center. Can you enlighten us in respect of this treaty that, that you, you mentioned this now between the, the country concerned. I can actually, thank you for the opportunity because um, I, I was having a chat with a lawyer about reciprocal enforcement about five years ago. And they said, well, of course, you could use the principle of comity. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up if you know what that is because you're all brilliant lawyers and you'll all know, but I didn't because I'm not. And so I looked it up, and it was very helpful. It just said that uh, 
it means that people will be nice to each other. So I, I was visiting the UK uh, courts, and I met the Lord Chief Justice uh, John Thomas, as he was then, head of the Queen's Bench, and the head of the Commercial Court, who was a, is a brilliant lady who's gone off to the Court of Appeal now, Liz Gloucester. And I said, you know, have you heard of this thing called comedy? And they said, oh, yes, it's very well known. I said, could you tell me how it works? Hmm. And the table was is a little bit smaller than this, a little bit wider, and one book appeared, then another book, then another book, then I called two of our judges who were based in London, and they sat down, and the whole afternoon and evening, until 8 o'clock when we went for dinner, the table piled high with books about how comedy actually works. No one had a clue. It's not used as a technique. So I said, look, wouldn't it be smart to put down on a piece of paper how it actually works in practice. Not a law, not a treaty, just a set of procedures so people will know. It took me six months. We published that and now there is a guide as to how you take a judgment from our court and enforce it in London. You sue on the judgment, it says you file form 73, you go to counter 12, you use this rule. What an eye-opener for business! At last they realise how they can go about taking a judgement from the Middle East to London and vice versa. It had always been there, but no one knew how it worked. So in addition to treaties, which are invaluable messages from the state that there'll be enforcement, the whole common law world is connected by comity. And after we did London, which gets you access to Europe, I got a phone call from the Australian, uh, Australians. And I said, well, it just so happens, actually, I'm going to be in New Zealand next week, changing the international framework for court excellence. And um, I said, I'll stop by. So I stopped off in Sydney, met the chief judge, chief justice, brilliant uh, lawyer, actually. And he said, I get it. I want one. So he signed with Australia. And when we were signing, the federal courts from Australia called and said, why are you signing with the New South Wales courts? You should sign with us. So we went back and we signed with them. Then New York, and it goes on and on. They're common law. We've just signed them with two civil law countries, Kazakhstan and Korea. So it's not limited to common law or civil law. Now that globalization of courts, other than by treaty, is what starts the web of connection that supports the arbitration institutes. Because arbitration will continue to be hugely successful. Will it grow like it's done over the last 25 years? My view, no. Could there be a tipping point which drives people away from our emerging centres? Absolutely, I believe there is if we don't act now. But even if it did, domestic arbitration would keep us going. So arbitration is not going anywhere. It's just how do we secure our position in it? And we do that by having courts that support the growth of arbitration more than they've done in the past. And I don't know about Malaysia, it sounds as if Malaysia is doing a superb job of that, but that's a lone star in a barren world of emerging markets and the relationship between arbitration and courts. Uh, may I put a question to you, Mark? Two points you made uh, had a big impact on me. One was the flight of trust you mentioned and the other was the bailout. So if I can come to the bailout, Bernanke, then the man who ran the Federal Reserve, he provided about three trillion dollars to bail out the banks and financial institutions on the ground that they were too big to fail. They failed because of a lot of criminal conduct taking liberties with all sorts of things and uh, yet money was given to them this enormous sum of money notwithstanding the ruin that it caused to a whole lot of other people now here's the question whose money was he giving out this three three trillion and, and increasing increasing whose money was that on the assumption that it was the money of the taxpayer and that was where it was going to come from, 
I use the words on the assumption advisedly because Bernanke was asked whose money is this and he said oh uh, the same place where you your money comes from he said where is that a computer in our office <laughs> well a facetious answer but very serious implications for all of us and my question simply is this all this trillions of dollars that are being given under the name of quantitative easing. The second point on the flight of trust, I'm told that on the American dollar, there are the words, in God we trust, and somebody said everybody else pays cash. <laughs> but if the cash in the form of this quantitative easing has got no value in itself, what is the future of arbitration? Well, that's not an easy one for uh, a recovering lawyer to answer, but I think what what it shows us is when, what was it they said about when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing any, any clothes? And the people who suffer when there's a flight are you and me. It's you and me and the small people and the small organizations. They were the ones that suffered. But the three trillion look very nice in Goldman Sachs' balance sheet, thank you very much. Paid the biggest bonuses they ever paid out in 2009, 2010. So when there's a flight of trust, it's the little ones that lose and it's the big ones that gain. 35 years, I don't know. I don't know whether you'd consider yourself a little one. We are, in Dubai, and I'm very worried. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please, uh, Mr. Su. If I may, my name is Su Tiang Ju, and I belong to the group which has been vilified and demonized <laughs> as the group that has caused a lot of pain to arbitration. I'm a lawyer and I'm proud of it. <laughs> now, without lawyers, I'm sure the first institution to fail will be arbitration. You need the lawyers. Then there is a comment to the fact that where arbitral awards are concerned, Please do not set it aside. If that be the case, I think the same should hold true for the courts. There should be only one tier of court. There should be no appellate courts at all. I'm sure, as far as the High Court judges are concerned, their award will be of the same standing, if not higher, of that of the arbitral award. Then why do we, should we have appellate courts? There should be these check and balances. And that is where the strength of the court and the judicial system is. There is also mentioned one of the reasons for failure where arbitral process is concerned is obesity, scarcity of talent. Mm -hmm. But where the talent is concerned, it comes from the pool of lawyers. While there may be one or two bad apples and what have you, I think it cannot be denied that it is the lawyers who help to push the arbitral process. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Su. Any comments from the panel? I think the jury will be out for a long time on this one. I, I don't agree, Mr. Su. Mr. Su, the difference between a judge and an arbitrator is the parties choose the arbitrator. The parties choose the arbitrator who is an expert in the field that he's supposed to make a decision in. Whereas the judge is otherwise. And the judge learns from the experts before giving a judgment on whatever subject it is. 
whereas the arbitrator is meant to use his knowledge on the subject to make a decision. And if parties decide to choose A to be the arbitrator, then unless the arbitrator really makes a very, very major error in this decision, then the parties should be bound by that decision. That's my view. Thank you. Following on the question by Mr. Su, can I ask a question of Mr. Su, uh, Dr. Sundra? Um, given the efficiency of the courts these days compared to yesteryears, um, has it affected the numbers uh, at the RCA? I, I think it's challenging. <laughs> I put it in a, in a very mild way. <laughs> no, it is. I, 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 I think the courts are becoming uh, efficient, you know, and uh, disposing the cases has put uh, a tremendous amount of pressure on arbitration. So that hence, that's why we came up with the fast track rules. So quickly, you know, we have an expedited procedure set in so people who want to actually speed up their, their cases. So uh, it's about autonomy of, uh, of the parties to choose the procedure they want. And that's what we have done. So if you go, let's say, uh, in the traditional route, then uh, a bit different, arbitration is a bit different from uh, court procedure, particularly how the arbitrator and the court decides. Uh, the court will decide uh, on, let's say, if there are 10 points. In many situations, it may just decide on two points and say it is conclusive of the, of the dispute and resolves it. An arbitrator is not allowed to do that. An arbitrator must, if it's 10 points, he must decide all 10 points, even if it's uh, peripheral, but he still has to deal with it. So hence, it takes, sometimes he has to take more time and uh, more information must be led before him and more arguments have to be submitted before him, before he decides. So there is actually a qualitative and quantitative difference between arbitration and court procedure. And whatever the, it's very, very interesting also, there is no binding precedence uh, in the decision of the, the, uh, of the arbitrator an arbitrator's decision is peculiar to that particular dispute it is. So there is no, I mean, people talk about we should actually publish arbitral awards, redacted ones, and then other arbitrators and other parties can look at it. And that's actually happening in investment arbitration. Investment arbitration because public interest is involved. So there is a public international law is developing through uh, that investment arbitration. But I would say that it's a special type of arbitration. But generally, domestic and international arbitration, uh, even if the institutions are moving towards actually publishing redacted awards, it is not taken as binding on even the courts. Of course, definitely not the courts, but uh, not on other arbitral tribunals. I think that's the big difference. Thank you. Can I invite uh, Yangaman Arif, Dr. Dr. Naim, to share some uh, views on this uh, point about arbitration and courts and so on? Share your point of view. Thank you. I'm, I'm very, very surprised. <laughs> Thank you, Datuma. Um, just to share with, uh, with the audience, uh, uh, with regard to uh, the question of the arbitration, uh, there is a specific terminology used um, under the Sharia principles, which is known as hakam. So it is clearly stipulated in, in the Holy Quran. Uh, but that applies with regard to the, when there is a dispute between husband and wife. Of course, uh, this evening we were discussing on, on the financial uh, dispute, etc. Of course, that one doesn't apply as far as the Sharia courts are concerned, because the Sharia courts in Malaysia, we only deal with uh, the family matters. But even in, uh, in, in, in family matters, the very concept of arbitration or hakam is clearly stipulated in the Holy Quran. So when it is stipulated in the Holy Quran by, by the lawgiver, by the creator, so we believe as Muslims, and, 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 and as far as the Chinese court, uh, court are concerned, the arbitration or the hakam for that matter will not, um, um, will not perish. Uh, it will be there because the principle is enunciated in, in, in the Holy Quran. Um, um, as a matter of application, as a matter of application, like, 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 like mediation, arbitration, the Sharia court, uh, of Selangor, for example, we have 
uh, introduce what is known as the hakam rules or the arbitration rules. But again, that applies in so far as it relates to the family disputes, not the financial. So we still deal within the jurisdiction of, of the Sharia courts. But, but you can expand. I can expand if you know the principle can be applied to any dispute, isn't exactly it? Exactly, Tony. As, exactly as far as the Quran is concerned, it can apply to dispute of any any uh, types, not just limited to family. Uh, we limit to family because the Sharia jurisdiction is only to family. Exactly, Tony. Uh, the, the Quran only provides a general principle, Tony. It only provides a general principle because it is a book of guidance. So I agree with you, though it is mentioned in relation to the family matters, but it can also be extended because what Islam encourages is uh, is when uh, is the settlement. How can settlement be achieved? We have the traditional way of resolving uh, a dispute, i.e. by uh, adjudication by a judge. But there are also other ways, which is known as the alternative dispute resolutions. We have mediation in Sharia Accord. We apply suit. For hakam purposes, we apply uh, arbitration. So these are basically, um, um, and, and we provide. In 2014, we provide a specific rules uh, known as arbitration rules or hakam rules, which clearly encourage, uh, which is clearly. Um, depart from the traditional way of setting disputes uh, by referring the parties to the judge. So now, when, when, when there is a dispute between a husband and wife, and we have a problem where the husband, for example, the husband refuses to pronounce talaq. Uh, the husband uh, refuses to pronounce talaq. And when the husband refuses to pronounce talaq, the matter drags for, ma for months and years because he, pro he, he refused to, 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 to dissolve the marriage. Now, what we do in Selangor is when we have these arbitration rules or hakam, we uh, provide uh, a limit where the matter needs to be resolved by the, the hakam. And we have a new interpretation. We used, before we had these uh, uh, hakam rules in 2014, the hakam or the arbitrators must be appointed uh, within the family members of the husband and wife. But now we have extended, extended the, the appointment of the arbitration not only among the family members, but uh, those parties who are specialized in the family matters. So we have currently appointed about 30 arbitrators, or we know call the, 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 them as hakam. So when there, there is this court between the husband and wife, and the husband refuses to pronounce talaq, then the court will ask the parties to appoint the 30, among the 30 uh, arbitrators or hakam. And within that three, um, uh, three months, then the hakam will be able to resolve uh, the matter, so they don't have to drag it more than more than three months. So, so th that's how I'm, I'm sharing uh, the application of hakam or arbitrations in the Sharia court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Ko. Thank you, um, Mark, for a very invigorating and sober view. I want to focus on one word: collaboration. On the top topic. About a year and a half ago, we were down in Singapore, let's name the country. There was an international arbitration gathering. And there was the topic is the rise of Asia. Conspicuously absent on the panel is KRLCA. Now, I say this not in discourtesy to SIC, which is clearly uh, one of the winners of a respected institution. Uh, you referred to Charles Darwin, the, the harsh Darwinian principle of competition and uh, survival of fittest but you did not quite elaborate on collaboration. So is it a selfish gene that will drive institutions to destroy others, to beggar your neighbors, or is it possible that lawyers, uh, my learner friend Mr. Su, uh, stakeholders from the inns of court, the local institution of learning, the Sharia community, that we work together to build our institutions, including arbitral institutions, uh, Yes, there's a harsh reality of competitiveness where not effective or efficient institutions may die, but let us collaborate. And may we ask from you, perhaps have some closing remarks, how do you see collaboration uh, in terms of Middle East with the uh, East of Middle East, and then the East Asia with the rise of Japan and Korea uh, and Australia, of course, playing a major role. 
maybe thermal marks on you on other than Darwin is their collaboration. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think I, uh, I think it was Garfield that I quoted, um, modeled on the Darwinian principle. Uh, I think collaboration at a court level, uh, and I was really blown away by um, my visit this morning to the, uh, to the highest court in the country and to meet uh, the Chief Justice, who is another brilliant Chief Justice, if I may say so, um, following in a long line of brilliant Chief Justices. Um, and I, I would love to work more closely with the Malaysian judiciary at a judicial level. I think at an arbitration centre, I go back to focus, strength and differentiate. I think we need to focus on what we're doing well. Um, I think we need to strengthen what we're doing well by telling people about it. But I'll focus on the third one, differentiate. For example, the IRB rules that you've got are applicable globally. You can't get a brochure on them in Dubai yet, but why not? Why aren't they available? Why isn't there a Dubai phone number that people can call? which links directly into an IARB number here. Why isn't it happening in Bahrain? Because we're not putting on a set of arbitration rules that are Islamically compliant. It's not part of our strategy to do that. But why would we deny others access to the information? See, these are very simple tools where we identify what we are strong at and we find ways of collaborating to promote that. So I, I think at a basic level, the arbitration centers can come together and say, we are the rising stars. We can climb that mountain together. Together, how do we do it? And I think that would be great. As I say, I'd be absolutely delighted if there's more that we can do at a judicial level uh, as well. Thank you. I'm, going, I'm taking up the idea straight away. <laughs> we will do it tomorrow. <laughs> we'll have, uh, we will, we will have uh, a number you can call anywhere in the world, and it will come to us. <laughs> can I ask a question, Mr. Beer? Uh, you did mention about uh, unifying uh, earlier on. Um, whom exactly do you have in mind, so far as uh, CARA RCA is concerned, and what kind of model would that take? M you, you mentioned mod uh, unifying. Unifying, collaboration, unifying, and so on. Whom exactly do you have in mind, as far as RCA is concerned? And, and the, and the, the unification comes not just between the emerging market arbitration centers, but also between the judiciaries and the arbitration centers themselves. You know, judges make funny common comments about arbitrators at dinners, and arbitrators make funny comments about judges. Uh, ha, ha, ha. But dissonance drives business away you know if I have the slightest fear about Hong Kong I move to Singapore not me the contract okay if I have the slightest doubt that KLRCA is hand in hand with the court that is the state arm of enforcement I'll go to Singapore if I worry in the slightest that the judges look down upon the arbitrators in Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia. I'll move to Singapore. The unification of message is vital on the global platform. Judges talking alongside arbitration centers is very powerful. And the message is this. If you come to us, you choose your judge. It may not be faster and it may not be cheaper, but you only have to do it once. Because if you sign up to arbitration, you don't want an appeal. That's why you sign up to it. So you choose your arbitrators, and we have a brilliant, talented pool of arbitrators. You choose your rules, including novel rules like Islamic arbitration. It's one shot. It's, it, it, you know, you, you're not going to be in endless appeals. And when you get a piece of paper, you take it down to the courthouse, and you convert it into a document which the state will enforce. That's a really powerful, unified message for a state to give. And I think the success of nations which have got it right is the fact that their chief justice travels the world telling everybody, arbitrate in my country. Yeah? If you think about it. Arbitrate in my country. Now, not many chief justices do that. But what message does that send to people who choose that country? The message is, 
arbitrate in that country, choose my judge, get a good set of rules, and know that the Chief Justice is telling me that he will look after me when I get the piece of paper. Very powerful, unified message. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left. Uh, any concluding remarks or any other comments? Yes, please, uh, Lisa. No disrespect. No disrespect meant to the arbitral process nor the judiciary, but I would like to add to what Mr. Su said just now. I think sometimes judges look at lawyers setting aside awards as just being pesky. But I have come <laughs> but I have come across however brilliant the arbitrator was. He made a monumental mess of his reasoning and to be exact, a pure breach of natural justice. The litigant, uh, or rather the, the, the respondent, was not allowed to address a point that he made in his award. So the litigant goes to the court, and then the judge says, yes, I agree that there's breach of natural justice, but you did not prove prejudice. The fact that there was an award of $2 million against the poor chap, and the judge says that you haven't proven prejudice. So that is why I feel, and I understand what Mr. Su just now was saying, lawyers are just not being pesky, and lawyers do not stop enforcement. But if there's a breach of natural justice, and I feel quite passionately about that, the court should step in and not tell us Hey, you choose the arbitrator, you go to Caesar, you're bound by Caesar's judgment. I think that's really unfair. Thank you, Dr. If you don't want appeal, if you want a one-stop shop, if you want the process which should be fast, if lawyers do their professional duty, choose arbitration. If you want the automatic right of appeal, choose courts. But don't agree to arbitration, and then when you don't like the answer, try and persuade a judge that it's not fair, because life isn't fair, and arbitrators get it wrong <laughs> every now and again. And I'll perhaps finish with this anecdote. One of our judges, when he was appointed a judge, went to a very elderly but respected Supreme Court judge in England. And this is about the point about getting it right. And the Supreme Court judge said, a few things you must know about being a judge. When you start being a judge, you want to get every case right. You read all the documents. You research all the laws. You read all the precedent. And you can hope to get it right 80% of the time. But after 10 years, you know, I mean, oh, these cases, oh, and there's a shooting at the weekend, and oh. You kind of read most of it. You definitely read the skeletons, maybe whilst the opening arguments are being given. And you maybe read some of the cases, but you kind of know it all because you've been a judge for 10 years. So maybe you'll get it right 60% of the time. But after 20 years of doing it, oh. Another, oh, Mr. Smith, you again. <laughs> the advice that he was given was this. When you get it right less than 50% of the time, it is your duty to the parties to toss a coin. <laughs> yes, uh, that will go. I'd, I'd like to support Lisa on what she said, because um, judicial support for arbitration doesn't mean that you ignore uh, cases where there's been a, a serious breach of natural justice. I think everybody realizes that. And if you look at our Arbitration Act, uh, you one of the grounds for re resisting enforcement is that there's a breach of the rules of natural justice. So you can't take the 
uh, the fact uh, arbitration friendly judges, it, it cannot mean that uh, you just take the award, uh, good or bad, um, just like that. Right, I think uh, we'll draw this discussion to a close. Can you please join me with a round of applause and appreciation to Dr. Sundra, <laughs> Mark Greer, and Sunzaki. Before we do conclude, I would like to call upon Dr. Mary Lim of the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn. She's the one that brought everyone here together, all the inns, to present a token of appreciation to our presenters. Uh, just, yep. Can we please put our hands together for Mr. Mark Beer? Can we also put our hands together for Young Bagir, Tun Dato Sri, Saki Tun Azmi. Can we put our hands together for Mr. Dato Sundra Raju from RC? And last but not least, Dato Ma, if you could kindly have you in front. Thank you so much for moderating this session. Thank you presenters, thank you panelists, thank you distinguished guests, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, please do stay back, there's coffee, there's tea. Uh, thank you so much, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.